So I think we'll get started, ladies. Uh, if more people come in, I will let them in. Uh, but basically tonight we're going to talk about tips and tricks um, to navigating your holiday eating. And if you see me looking over here to the side, it's just because I have my notes there. Um, before we get started, I would love to hear from you guys. What are your biggest fears um, and challenges for the holidays? Like what, what prompted you to join me tonight? Is there something in particular that you're concerned or fearful of? That might be helpful so that I can address that. So is there anyone who would like to share, um, either verbally you can unmute yourself or you can message me in the, in the chat box. Is there anything tonight that you specifically were concerned about that you wanted to have addressed? I'll start it off. Okay. So I'm concerned about the fact that I've been doing so well and I'm really afraid of being around all of the really good cookies and candies and the old me would start by having a few and then figure well wow, piss on it I've already ruined it I may as well just eat the rest of it and I yeah. need to know how to not let that happen again okay so you're worried that you're gonna basically drop the ball kind of thing and then just spir spiral downwards is that what I'm getting from you okay all right I think that's a pretty common concern um, so I don't think you're alone. So that's a really good, a good point that we'll touch on for sure. And um, I think Silvana just joined us, I do believe. Hello, if you can hear me, Silvana. Just wanted to say hi to everybody. Um, so for those who just joined again, tonight we're gonna to talk about tips and tricks to navigate holiday eating. Um, if you're open to it, let me know what your biggest fears are and challenges are for the holiday. You can unmute yourself and just you know, pop on and let me know and I'll make sure to address that. I wanna keep this um, really free and open tonight. I do have some specific things I'm gonna review. Um, so you'll see me looking at my notes over here, but I do want it open forum. So guys, you know, if you've got something that you want to ask, um, interject at any time, I'm totally comfortable with that, okay? So let's dive in. Um, as Shelly mentioned, you know, the holidays, especially when you're new to um, the Metabolic Balance Program or any program for that matter, when you're on a roll, one of the biggest things that most people are afraid of is just falling off and not being able to get back on. Um, and it's sad, right? Because the holidays are a time of joy. We're supposed to be relaxing and enjoying ourselves and having fun with the family, but they also come with some stress um, for those who are trying to eat healthy or trying to lose weight. And unfortunately, you know, the most popular advice out there is some pretty basic stuff. And it's not that it's bad advice, but it's just not that easy. It's really not that simple to just, you know, make sure you are well fed before you go to, let's say there's a party, which with COVID, there's probably not going to be many parties, but you know, the old things that I would tell people would be, you know, don't show up hungry, make sure you eat before you get there. Um, choose your indulgence wisely. Um, you know, be careful of your alcohol because there's calories in that too, right? Those are pretty standard things and there's so much more to it than that. And so I want to dive into a lot of that tonight for you girls. Um, so those are great tips. They're, you know, those three simple tips about being wise with the calories of your alcohol and choosing wisely. Those are great, but let's really be honest here. Holiday weight gain is is a big factor for those who are in the process of losing weight. And there's actually some studies, um, which I'll, I'll tell you about this one study, because this study actually showed that holiday weight gain is less of a big deal than what we make of it. So, you know, our biggest fear is we're gonna put on 10 pounds and we're never gonna be able to get it back off and we're never gonna be able to go back to our healthy eating. That's our biggest fear for many of us. Um, but the fact is the average American, this study is an American study. So the average American gains between one and 10 pounds between their Thanksgiving and Christmas. Okay. So that's an average of one to 10 pounds. And there's a few different studies that will um, basically will show that. But this one particular study showed that when scientists compared people's perceived weight gain versus their actual weight gain, they found that the average person thought they gained three and a half pounds. So think of that, you know, basically a month, month or six weeks between the, the holidays for the US. So they thought they gained three and a half pounds, but the actual weight gain was under a pound. Okay. 
However, this particular um, stats, these stats were based on those who were not overweight and those who were not trying to lose weight. Okay, so for those group of people, holiday weight gain is, is not a big deal at all. A pound is nothing, right? That is, I mean, you can gain a pound just because you didn't poop. You can gain a pound because you drank more water or had more, more salty food. So, you know, that's really neg negligible. It's, it's really nothing to be concerned about. However, when they did this comparison for those who are obese and overweight, this is the numbers that they found. 20% of obese subjects and 10% of overweight subjects gained more than five pounds. Okay, so that is in comparison to 5% of the healthy weight people. So of the healthy weight people, only 5% gained. Um, but that same study showed that people who were overweight or obese gained either 20% for the overweight, over, sorry, obese gained 20%. Um, of, let me get this straight again. 20% of obese individuals gained weight, and that was more than five pounds and 10% of the overweight subjects um, gained more than five pounds, okay? So there is a significant difference. There was also another study that showed for people who used to be overweight, so they're no longer overweight, but they had lost weight and they've maintained it and done wonderful. Um, they, this particular study found that despite working harder to maintain their weight, 39% of the people who lost weight gained at least 2.2 pounds over the holidays, okay? Whereas only 17% of the healthy weight group gained. So basically what I'm getting from this is you're twice as much likely to gain weight during the holidays if you've lost weight in the past, if you are obese, or if you're overweight. That's basically to summarize that you're twice as much uh, likely to gain weight over the holidays. So yes, we need to be mindful. I'm not going to preach to you and tell you to give up all your favorite foods. Absolutely not, because I will not be the one at the table doing that. I love my food. I love to indulge. And I think it's really important that we have a healthy mindset around food. So what the, the key is keeping up some of our holiday traditions and some of your favorites, but making some trade-offs. And also learning how to regroup after and setting some limitations. So let's first talk about what are the holidays, because I think that's really important that we go into it with a really good mental mindset. Um, I think a lot of us feel that the holidays are a time to really indulge. And it's, it's kind of a cue. It's like a free pass. And I think we need to wash that out of our mindset because it's just another holiday and there is going to be more holidays. What we really need to do is look at it like another treat meal. Okay. Um, and break it down. Like you might end up having a couple of treat meals, a couple days in a row, but break it down into smaller time frames. It's, it's a holiday, but the holiday is not just the food. The treat meal is the food part. Okay. So, also recognizing some of the cues that fall into holiday eating, um, aside from the mental mindset of thinking it's a free pass, but also recognizing that there's often some social pressures. Uh, again, with COVID, there may be a little less social pressures, but you know, studies show that people eating with a group change their eating patterns and will kind of match the people that they're with. So um, one of the things, of course, with holidays is that there's always an abundance of food. You know, we, we definitely, we have, you know, how many sides, it's not just like a protein, a veg, it's like multiple proteins, multiple veg, multiple starch, right? So there's always that abundance. So there's always going to be that possibility and that um, cue to overeat because there's so much placed out in front of us. And so it's a psychological cue to overeat when we see all of this, even though nobody's saying it out loud, right? How many times have we've all been guilty of this where we will go back for a second plate of food because there's just so much food, right? But on a regular basis, we might not do that. We're not even hungry. We're just doing it because hey, it's enjoyable and we're sitting around and enjoying the company of the others around us. So recognizing that social cue is really, really important so that you can prepare yourself 
and make a plan to navigate through that. The other thing that also comes around with the holidays is stress, right? A lot of times it's stressful for different reasons. Sometimes it's the stress of, you know, finances. Sometimes it's the stress of having to do extra on top of your already busy lifestyle. Um, and stress is a powerful cue for eating, right? How many of us are emotional eaters? So our cortisol also goes up when we're stressed. And of course that promotes weight gain. And it also promotes more indulgences because when cortisol rises, it makes you crave, it makes you hungrier. And so recognizing our stress when we're in these um, settings of, you know, our holiday seasons is really, really important so that we can help ourselves to maybe decrease our stress load or at least just acknowledge it so that we're not stuffing our faces instead of doing something that's going to help to relieve the stress, right? The one thing that I find for me that's a really big cue for um, overindulging during the holidays, though, is broken routines, right? Um, I know for, for a fact myself, like I'm counting down the days, my son's coming home on um, December 23rd, and so I'm really excited um, but I'm also excited because it's going to break up my routine. I'm going to be home for a solid week, week and a half. Um, you know, I'll sleep in a little bit. I won't have to get up and go to work, right? So for me, that is one of the big problems I have. When I break my routine, when we have the time off, we may not work out as regularly if you work out. You may not have your regularly scheduled foods, and that's a big disaster um, for staying on track, right? Because if you sleep in and then it's too late for breakfast, so maybe you'll push it a little bit later and you'll just have lunch and then you'll have dinner. And then before you know it, it's nighttime and you're hungry because you skipped your breakfast. So now you're wanting to snack. So this, you know, breaking our routines can really erase our cues, our cues for eating healthy um, during our normal schedule. Um, and so we really want to, um, try our best to stay on a schedule, you know, or at least create a plan so that you are not giving yourself um, these broken cues where, um, you know, during the holidays, we might literally be just so out of whack that everything becomes out of whack. And then, of course, I talked a little bit about the emotional associations, right? Um, we eat in abundance sometimes because maybe it's our favorite aunt's best pie. You know, maybe she makes an amazing uh, pecan pie, let's say. Um, and so you'll indulge extra in that because this is the only time of year that you're gonna have that pecan pie because she only makes it at Christmas time, let's say. So there are those emotional associations to certain foods. Um, I'm trying to think for me, what I, I can't remember if there's anything specific at Christmas time, but I can tell you like throughout the year, there are certain foods that I will resort to when I need comfort. And a lot of it is things that my mom used to make when I was a kid, right? So recognizing these emotional cues going into the holidays can make you choose better options or you know, give and take in different areas. Um, because certainly I don't want you to refuse those foods that are particularly um, enjoyable and they're only gonna come around this time of year, right? We don't want you to say no to everything so we do want you to be able to indulge and still have those traditions. So with all those cues, the main things that we want to do now is A, we want to recognize them, right? We want to acknowledge them in the moment. So when it comes time to your holiday meal, you'll want to actually acknowledge if you're about to overeat, let's say, sit with that feeling for a moment. So what's driving you to go back? Are you hungry? Are you searching for some emotional comfort? Are you stressed? You know, is it a social cue because there's just so much food around? So really acknowledge it in the moment, um, but do your best to keep a normal routine in the holidays. You know, try to go to sleep at the same time, try to get up at the same time. If you're into exercising, whatever that means, keep your movement going. Um, and then of course, in between, because most of us are gonna be on holidays between between um, Christmas and New Year's, fill the in-between time with all the stuff that's not part of your routine, right? Like go enjoy time with family, go, you know, take up a new hobby, 
do things in between your meals and your sleep um, that are not part of your routine. A couple of other things that you can do to recognize those cues is decide ahead of time what favorite recipes are you going to indulge in, okay? So for me, it's always about, um, you know, usually desserts. If I'm gonna indulge, it's gonna be dessert. It's not gonna be alcohol. I'd much rather eat my calories and I have a sweet tooth. So decide ahead of time if there's something in particular or some things in particular that you are gonna indulge in and just make that commitment to yourself and maybe even commit to how much you're gonna have. You know, if you have a favorite cookie or two that you like, um, decide, okay, how many am I gonna have at this sitting? Like think that far ahead because this way you're planning for it. There's no guilt. Um, and then there's also a plan in place and you're likely to follow that commitment if you made it before you're in the moment. You can also make sure to be very mindful while you're eating your meals. Um, I find that too often we eat too quickly. It literally takes 20 minutes for your brain to get the notice that you've eaten. And so if you're eating too quickly, a couple of things are happening. You're not digesting your food properly. Um, digestion actually starts in the mouth. So one of the first enzymes that's produced is in your mouth and it's called amylase. And so you'll know um, amylase because if you were to suck on a candy, it dissolves the candy, right? You don't have to chew it. And that candy has sugar in it. And so amylase actually breaks down carbohydrates. So that's why if you suck on bread, it dissolves. So chewing first in the mouth is really, really important. And putting your fork down periodically keeps you more in the moment and eating mindfully and listening to those cues, like really feeling the food in your mouth, chewing it well, you know, smelling it, tasting it. All of those sensations are really important to keeping you satiated and full. So, um, but chewing is super, super important. The one thing that I always tell my clients who are fast eaters is your stomach does not have teeth, okay? So if you're eating too quickly, you're gonna get more gas because you're gonna get undigested food that's much larger in the stomach and the stomach's gonna start churning and then you're gonna feel bloated. So make sure you chew your food really well. And then of course, watch for those signs of overeating. You know, feeling gassy and bloated is a sign that you may have overeaten and feeling tired, like if you're feeling really, really tired after eating a meal, it's probably because you overate, okay? So what happens when we overeat is, um, well, basically your stomach, first off, its biggest job is to secrete hydrochloric acid. And that helps to break down the food in the stomach. So whatever you haven't chewed up well enough, the stomach will start to break that down even further. The hydrochloric acid also breaks down um, and helps to kill off bacteria. Um, and so as the food moves through your digestive system, this is kind of a process that, that's happening in the gut. So if you're not chewing your food well enough, or if you've overeaten, then you're gonna have more gassiness and bloating because that hydrochloric acid hasn't had enough of a chance to work on it. And so you'll, your body will actually produce, your stomach will actually produce more hydrochloric acid the more you eat. And so it keeps producing it and producing it. And then this is also why sometimes you'll get heartburn or acid reflux if you've overeaten because your, your stomach is producing more and more of that acid to break down all that food that you just ate if it's too much. On top of that, these bigger meals are digested much slower and so they spend more time in the stomach which creates more of that gassiness and bloating. And then because of this, you're actually sending more energy to your, your stomach so there's less energy to go to your other vital organs. And this is why you'll often feel more fatigued because just to sit here without eating, it takes 10% of our body's energy for our digestive system. So that's without eating. So imagine when you eat a huge meal that's just too big uh, compared to what you'd normally eat, it's gonna drain your body of even more energy. So on top of that, when you overeat, Remember that metabolic balance is all about blood sugar regulation and insulin. So when you overeat, your blood sugar is gonna go up a lot higher, you're gonna get a spike, your insulin's gonna go up, you're gonna feel energized for a little bit, and then you're gonna have this crash after. 
And so of course that in turn is also going to get you more into a fat burning stage because it's going to have that insulin spike for much longer than it normally would. So, and then what happens is the next day, you're probably going to feel like you have a hangover, right? And, um, and you're probably going to be starving the next day. So, you know, back to your concern, um, Shelly, this is um, something that we'll chat a little bit more about how to overcome that. Because even for myself, you know, I've been following that about balance now for seven years. But when I overindulge on the weekends, I'm starving Monday morning, like I'm hungry and my stomach's growling, you know, I could have eaten my breakfast at my same time in the same breakfast, same amount that I always eat. But Monday morning, I'll be starving. And it's all part of that, just that blood sugar push and that insulin push um, that sh just throws your body out of whack. So sometimes just knowing that, you know, to expect that, you'll know that you're not going to die of starvation. Just drink lots of water, you'll get through it, your body will get back to the way it was. It just takes a little bit. So, um, and then aside from all of those other symptoms that I mentioned about, you know, overeating, the other side effects, as, you know, you might get the gassy, bloating heartburn, but you also may get um, brain fog and difficulty concentrating and just have a headache. So, you're going to feel really gross. So, what I truly recommend is, you know, have your holiday meal, whatever that means for you. Um, but definitely make sure you're not overeating because that is really going to drain your body. And it, on the same hand, it can also drive up your blood sugar, which might make you crave even more. So the key is everything in moderation. All right. So what can we do to avoid holiday weight gain? The number one thing that I'm going to suggest is plan for it. Okay. Plan it out. Seriously plan as best as you can. Decide if you know what you're having, uh, if you're having the actual meal at your home um, and during COVID, a lot of us probably are decide ahead of time. What's it worth to you? But also what you can do is track your nutrition. Um, you can do it a couple of different ways. You can do it through the Better app. Um, we have the journal there. And right now, I believe for most of you, I have it turned off. So you can't see your caloric intake or anything like that. But I could turn it on if you requested it. Or alternatively, use something like MyFitnessPal. And so tracking your, your nutrition um, it's actually shown in different studies that people who maintain food diaries eat about 15% less food than those who don't. And I can tell you that even with our better app where I have clients who do their journaling and track, um, I know that they do much better also because I get to see it. So if you ever, if you haven't used the journal, um, I actually get notifications anytime you journal. So it's another accountability approach as well. And so, you know, the one thing I like about tracking too is it will give you a really good understanding what foods have the higher caloric intake, which foods are higher in sugar, because you really may not know. And then at the end of the day, you can actually see it all put together and you might be quite surprised. I had a client once who she was snacking on, uh, are they called snap peas? I think they're called snap peas. She was snacking on snap, snap peas healthy, right? Vegetable. Well, I had her track because she was struggling and I had her track to see what was going on. And oh my gosh, I was shocked. I did not know there was a lot of sugar, natural sugars and snap peas, like so much. So as soon as we eliminated that, she was doing amazing. So, and of course with metabolic balance, you're not supposed to snack anyways, but it was, it was a big thing for her. So um, what else there? So decide on which foods you want to indulge in. So plan make a commitment to yourself, where are you going to indulge and how much, you know, you'll feel much better if you plan ahead of time, you'll feel less guilty about it and you'll feel prepared. But then you've got to also decide where you're going to eliminate. Okay. You've got to think of this like a bank account. You can make withdrawals and you can also make deposits. If you keep depositing, 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 your bank book is going to get really, really fat in a good way with money, but on our bodies, we don't want to make too many deposits, right? So you have to decide on some areas that you're going to eliminate. You know, it might be, okay, I'm going to have 
um, turkey and stuffing, but I'm not going to have mashed potatoes because ah, I'm not a big mashed potato person. So you can do little things like that. And in the end, they can make a huge, huge difference. The other thing that I also recommend is um, keeping up on your water, especially when your routine's out of balance, you might really find that your water drinking is down the drain, right? So keep up on your water, make that a priority. It's going to keep you full and hydrated. If you are just 1% under hydrated, your brain starts to shrink, your metabolism slows, hunger can increase and pain can increase only at 1%. And most of my clients are more than 1% under hydrated. So um, that can be super, super helpful. In our stomach, um, there's actually the sensors that tell us we're full. And when, they, when the stomach is empty, the, st the stomach will actually kind of shrink and those sensors are, are hidden in the folds of the stomach. So when you drink water and it expands, it actually presses on those sensors and tells, us, tells your brain that you're full. So drinking water can help with cravings and with hunger, okay? The last thing about planning ahead that I really, really want you to make sure you do is make sure you weigh yourself every day. I don't care if your weight goes up a little bit, I just want you to know where you're at. It's really important. Don't be that person who would rather not know, okay? Don't be that person. Make sure you know what's going on with your body. It's super, super helpful for you. Um, you know, running and hiding doesn't help. So make sure you weigh yourself every day. Pay attention to how you're feeling. Um, it's not always about the weight, though. Sometimes we just get puffy from certain foods, so you might feel clothing getting snug but just really um, take care of your own needs so that you, you know where you are. And sometimes that helps you to be a little more um, limited with your choices, right? Because if you see that you've gone up two pounds from two cookies, let's say I'm being exagger I'm exaggerating, but let's say you did go up two pounds from two cookies, um, you might really be mindful the next, at the next day or at the next meal kind of thing. So. So as I mentioned earlier, you know, I, I'm, not, I'm not recommending that you just say no to everything. I think that's a really poor strategy. Um, with Metabolic Balance, our whole goal is to, you know, achieve our goals with the meal plan that's been prescribed to us. But at the same time, we need to learn how to have mindful indulgences and enjoy life. So I really am not a supporter of saying no to everything. I really do want you to choose some things to indulge in. So ways that you can help to balance out those indulgences. Well, the eight rules in your book, there's eight rules to treat meals. Those rules still apply, right? And the number one rule is always make sure you have two bites of protein first, even if it's a treat meal, even if you're just gonna have a glass of wine to start before that treat meal. I want you to have two bites of protein before a glass of wine or before some alcohol. That protein is gonna slow down your insulin spike and your sugar spike. And it's also gonna keep you full and it's gonna to help to get your fat burning, okay? And then you'll also wanna make sure that you, you are being present and mindful, you know, like eat slowly, as I mentioned, you know, if it helps, use a smaller plate. Um, you will definitely eat less if you use a smaller plate. There's been studies and studies on that. Um, and of course, you know, try to skip the seconds, you know, try your best not to have a second plate because that's two meals, basically. The other rule that we always want to follow is don't snack between meals. Do your absolute best not to snack. And I know it's difficult, especially during Christmas, because we often will have little things like goodies sitting around or nuts or seeds, things like that. So snacking is gonna make your glucose rise, it's gonna activate your insulin, it's gonna create more cravings. And it, as soon as you break that fast, that five to seven hours between meals, you're not gonna be in fat burning anymore. So remember that, do your best not to snack. Um, and also, if you're going to have dessert, well, I'm gonna talk a little bit more about that, but you always wanna have dessert with your meal. Don't have dessert as a snack, okay? When you have it with your meal, it's gonna slow down that sugar spike because you would have had protein with it. And again, it's gonna keep you more satisfied. 
Okay. So if you overeat, don't beat yourself up. Just take a deep breath, move on, plan to make better choices next. That's it. Don't beat yourself up, move on. Okay. If you are active, as I mentioned earlier, try to do your best to exercise, keep your body moving. It's going to help with boredom too. I, I think especially this year, um, you know, our, our social lives are definitely different. Um, so, you know, take a stroll around the neighborhood, play an indoor, indoor game, um, you know, try to keep up your normal routines as much as possible. So desserts. Um, I mentioned about having dessert with your meal, but this, this is really, really important. If you are going to have dessert, there are a few things that you can do to offset it. One of, it, it, one of them is have it with your meal. The other thing is you can change up your recipe a bit. Try not to use as much white sugar. And I do have some substitutions that we'll talk about later, but you know, try your best not to use white sugar. White sugar is the devil, guys. It really is. It lights up the same part of your brain that um, Coke, like heroin and um, all of those drugs, like they, they light up the same feel good center. So try to make some replacements when you are baking. Try to use like banana or dates or even the coconut sugar, uh, just to name a few things. Okay. That's a good question, Mel. Mm -hmm. So I'm not a dessert person at all. Like I could care less about that. But for me, it's like chips. Okay. And snacks like that, salty and whatever. So what you were just saying about how the sugar lights up the brain, is this do the same thing? What kind of chips are you having? Because some of them have sugar in them. Oh, you name it. Check Every your labels. Time. Check your labels, right? Because some of the flavors have sugar in them too. And then the other thing I'll tell you on that note is the MSG. So check when it says flavor, that's often a cue for MSG. So MSG, I believe, has like 42 different things that could be, instead of saying MSG, um, it could say 42 different things. So spices sometimes can have MSG and it literally would just say spices on it. Flavor could mean MSG. Um, okay. So the thing with MSG too is um, that it is, it creates an addiction. It also um, affects the brain in a different way. It's a uh, neuroendocrine disruptor. And the scientists actually use MSG to fatten up, fatten up lab rats. Hmm. Yeah. So what it does is it makes them want to eat more and eat more and eat more. So they actually use it to get rats to eat more and eat more so they can make them obese. So that could be one thing with the chips for you, but certainly there, I know that there's sugar in some as well. So you might want to read your labels. Um, one of the things that I have found, I'm not a huge chip person, but for some reason, every once in a while, I go in these phases of wanting them. Um, I have switched to the kettle chips. They okay. definitely have very little ingredients. Like you'll see the ingredient list on like some of the flavored Lay's is like a huge ingredient list and on the kettle chips. It's mostly language. Like it's all language that you'll know. Um, and because they're crunchier, I find I won't eat as much. <laughs> so I don't know. It's helpful. It's win-win you get it, but um, yeah. less chemicals and you know, you still get to enjoy, right? Yeah. And sometimes I'll just grab a few salted almonds and sometimes that's enough yeah. for me between the crunch and the salt. Yeah. But I just wondered how, I know most women especially are big dessert people. Like I know I'm weird that I'm not. So you hear about people going for cookies and like they eat the whole row. Well, yeah. but I'm like that with like chips or yeah. nachos or that kind of thing. So I just wondered if when it does eventually break down, if it's doing the same thing as sugar. Yeah. I would say, um, I mean, the starch from it certainly could be activating, absolutely would be activating the, the glucose and insulin response in the body. Yeah, mm. for sure. Um, That's what I was wondering. So a couple of tips for you too, like Nicole, do you like olives and pickles and things? I like pickles. I don't like olives at all, okay. but I do like pickles. I do. I have been eating them. Okay. Yeah. So try, you know, try to get it in. they're salty and crunchy. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Try to get it in if you can. For okay. Sure. Yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, yeah. So definitely um, most people, it's the sugar. You're right, Nicole. Um, 
So here are some interesting facts, and, and this uh, may apply not just to sugar um, and desserts, but your thoughts can change your metabolism. Your thoughts can change your metabolism. So the fact is that the body stores fat when we take in more calories than we use, right? So if you have a surplus of calories, you're going to gain weight, right? If you're in a calorie deficit, you're going to lose weight, typically, unless there's some metabolic, uh, true metabolic medical disorders. And there's another fact that eating dessert with your meal slows down the glucose uptake. So in your case, Nicole, I would even say, you know, if you're gonna have chips, have it with your meal, <laughs> right? It's gonna help you out there. But another fact that a lot of people are not aware of is that fantasizing about food can change the chemistry of your insulin. So when you fantasize about food and you don't fulfill that fantasy. And if you can't, and you keep fantasizing over this food for days and days and days, what happens is there's something called a cephalic insulin. So this is an insulin response that is turned on just from thinking about food. Fact, okay? So this is where my motto is, you know, if you truly can't get that craving out of your head, just have it. Have a little bit, indulge a little, but do your best to follow the rules and have it with, with a meal. Um, and of course, limit the quantity, but always try to push yourself through that craving because often that craving is going to peter out sooner than you think. I know a couple months ago, I had this huge craving for chips and I don't know why, because I'm, I'm a sweets person and I'm not kidding you. It was two weeks. <laughs> two weeks and my husband was tired of me saying I want chips I want chips I want chips and we didn't have chips and then finally he came home with like three bags of chips I'm like oh my god what did you do this for well I ate those chips and I felt better but that normally doesn't last like we don't usually die from a craving right we really have to push ourselves so I was pretty proud of myself that I pushed myself for like two weeks but it was so bizarre to me that after two weeks I was still saying I want chips so in that case you know I didn't feel bad. I indulged. I, I did really well for two weeks. I did not have the chips um, and they were good and I enjoyed them. And then that was gone. Okay. Most of the time though, a glass of water, having something like a pickle or something salty will, will do the trick, but that particular time didn't do it for me. Um, and then as we kind of mentioned, you know, for some people who do have sugar cravings, the best thing you can do is actually eat a bitter food. So eat some cranberries, eat some, have some green tea or coffee, or even have some lemon and water, anything that's bitter. Um, also for some people just having a pickle or olives or something like that will help to offset that, that sugar craving. So you actually want to give your, your body the opposite to help with that craving. So I'm curious actually, Nicole, if that might work for you, um, you know, to maybe have something, uh, a piece of fruit or something, as opposed to the, to the chips. I wonder if that might help to offset you know, the opposite. So all in all, my biggest recommendation, as I kind of mentioned earlier, is just think of the holidays as just another treat meal. Okay, we really hype it up into more than what it is. It might be another treat meal or another treat meal or two, or maybe even three, but just think of it as like increments, right? Follow those treat meal rules, do your protein first, limit your meal to an hour, don't sit around the table and eat for two hours. Listen to your body signals. If you're full, stop eating. If you're not enjoying a food, don't eat it. You know, don't eat it just because it's on the plate. I would much rather you go get something else that you do enjoy than force yourself to eat something that's really not enjoyable, right? And think before you drink. Alcohol is another Another caloric intake that often gets missed, um, you know, you can get 150 to 175 calories in a beer, you can get 120 to 160 calories in a glass of wine, which doesn't sound like a lot, but if you have three glasses, you're basically almost consuming a meal in alcohol, right? Um, but you want to definitely get your alcohol intake while you're eating. One of the biggest things I recommend is for every glass of alcohol, glass of water with it, right? And, and do your best to have the alcohol with your meal for the same reason as desserts with the meal, that blood sugar and insulin spike. Um, if it's a type of buffet, if you are going to relatives and there's you know, a big spread of food, walk around the food first and, and see what's there. 
don't just keep scooping and putting everything on the plate um, because then you can be more selective and decide where you're going to spend your calories, right? Um, and of course, you know, the biggest thing is at the end of your festivities, return back to phase two. Just go back to phase two. This is where the planning comes to because if you know you have a couple of meals in a row that are going to be more festive, then you need to say, okay, on this day, I am back to phase two, going to be really strict again. Maybe even reread your book. Be sure to follow your instructions and your rules and your food list really, really carefully. But make that commitment to yourself that as of X date, you are going to be back on track 100%. Okay, so that you don't have that wiggle room to keep the festivities going. Does that make sense, guys? Okay. All right. So um, any questions or thoughts or input so far from anyone? You can unmute yourself if you'd like. I'm not really worried about the holidays because I'm just going to keep to my schedule. I'm not going anywhere. I'm the one that's going to be cooking. So it's, I'm still going to go to the gym. I'm not saying that it's going to be perfect. I'm not going to indulge in anything, but I'm like you too. Like I would rather eat my calories than drink. Like I, my drinking days are long gone. I'd rather eat it, right? Yeah. And so, and like um, Christmas Eve, it's only my son and my husband. And so usually being Italian, we have seafood. So maybe I'll have some fish I'm not normally allowed to have, but I don't need to worry about the cookies. I've been baking since the beginning and I haven't, I haven't touched any of the cookies. So it's, it's uh, I think it'll be okay. Like Good I said, for you. Just gonna continue because I don't feel good if I go off. I feel like it's so crappy. It's like not worth it anymore. Mm -hmm. If I eat something I'm not supposed to eat, I feel like okay, instant bloat and mm. instant gas. Really? Instant. Eh? Mm -hmm. So, so, so if that's if it is a uh, really big digestive issue there, Silvana, one thing that we might want to consider when you're ready. Um, you might want to think about having a digestive enzyme with the meals that you decide that you're going to treat. Um, sometimes it's an enzyme issue where when you eliminate a food for a long enough period, your body won't produce the enzymes to break that food down anymore. It's kind of a supply and demand. So just yeah. to put it out there, if you, know, if you do want to indulge and you don't want to feel that way, a digestive enzyme might be helpful. Because I you. didn't, like I went to my, my family a couple weeks ago, so it was the first, I was first time I was allowed to have my cheat meal well the cheat meal turned into like hours of eating now right mm. because it was all like you said around the table and I felt so like my the gas that I had instantly right wow and, but I've noticed too which is a huge thing for me I came home and then I went on the scale and I like did eat like pasta and bread and all my mom's stuff and I was only up a pound so to me that's a huge win because wow. if I ever would go away and come back, that scale would be up at least five pounds. Oh, that's fantastic news. Good for you, though. So that's I, it's like my metabolism and all of that sort of changing and my body isn't being as sensitive. So to me, that's a huge win. Like I was like a pound. That's it. Good. Yeah. Oh, I'm so happy for you. That's mm. awesome. Yeah. Very good. I see we just had someone else join us. Shirley. I'm not sure who Shirley is, but hi, Shirley. Thanks for joining us. All right. Anyone else have anything that they want to share or comment on? I'll comment. Sure. The other thing I was going to say, what you were saying about planning, the last four weeks have been very challenging for me because of just things I have going on out of my control. So when I don't meal prep, I do not do well. Because even though I try and get something decent, Mm -hmm. It's still just, it's not working. Mm. So I don't find it's affecting me terribly. I'm kind of sustaining, but it's disappointing to have four weeks go by and feel like you're kind of the same or upper pound or two when I was like killing it for 12 weeks. Right. Right. So if I keep the meal planning in place, then I'm fine. So I was just, I personally am working all through Christmas. So it's kind of like outside of a couple meals. I don't think it's going to be anything too crazy, but um, 
I was thinking for other people, just if they're meal preppers or whatever you guys were doing before that was working, even while you're on vacation, keep doing that. Like you were saying, keep to your routine and hopefully then when you do have those fun meals, it won't be as big of a deal. Yeah, that's it. That's a really good point. Really good point, Nicole. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, if you don't meal prep, you can't eat anything. If I don't meal prep, I can't go to the, the food, to the store and get something to eat. Do you know what I mean? Because of the way my plan is. So I have to, because I leave the house to go to work. So if I'm not at home, I'm like with Nicole, then I'm, when I, then I'm not eating really, because there's mm -hmm. nothing I can't run to somewhere and get food because it's just, it's, it's, I'm limited, right? So mm -hmm. meal prep is so important or I'm not eating. Yeah. yeah. Very good. Good points, ladies. All right. Um, I have a list of some food swaps and I'm hoping you girls can, uh, can also interject some food swaps. Um, so we talked about like if you're baking, um, ways that you can enhance your, your desserts is, you know, experimenting with less sugar, trying the sugar substitutions, even honey over white sugar, I recommend, you know, coconut sugar, maple syrup, stevia for some, for some things is good, um, processed dates, applesauce, stuff like that. Um, here's, a, here's a question for everyone. Okay, what is better, white meat or dark meat from the turkey? Anybody? White. Okay, anyone else wanna vote? I hope it's white. Anyone else want to vote? I think it's white, but I want to think, say it's dark for some reason. <laughs> All right. Guess what, guys? There's not a big difference. I'm a dark person. I'm a dark meat person. So I'm, I'm really pushing this one home. <laughs> so three and a half ounces of turkey without skin. Here's the comparison nutrition-wise. White meat has four grams of fat. Dark meat has eight grams of fat that's where the bad rap is on dark meat because it has eight grams of fat and it's saturated fat, okay? But otherwise, when you look at protein, white meat only has like two grams, which is like basically nothing of extra protein. Um, there's almost double the iron in the dark meat. There's double the zinc in the dark meat. There's ugh, way more folate, folate in the dark meat. And calorie wise, in that same three and a half ounces, there's only like 30 extra calories in the dark meat. So I thought I'd just put that out. I'm a dark meat lover. So, you know, for the extra four grams of fat, I, I don't really feel like, you know, one is better than the other. Just eat what you enjoy. All right. So eggnog, any eggnog fans out there? Yeah. Don't drink eggnog. <laughs> Don't do your, your liquid calories unless it's truly something that you're going you're gonna to make as a you know, substitution somewhere else. Because just one cup of eggnog with no alcohol could contain like 350 calories, guys. 350 calories. So unless that is just your thing that you look forward to over the holidays, you know, I, I would highly suggest stay away from that. Um, you know, have a glass of wine. It's half the calories and it's got antioxidants in it. Or have a glass of champagne. Um, champagne's a really interesting one because it's, it's bubbly, so we don't drink it as fast. So if you're more of a wine drinker and you find the wine goes down too quickly, switch to champagne because you'll drink less of it and you'll still get the enjoyment. Um, anyone like hot chocolate? You know, that warm cup of hot cocoa. There's some things you can do to um, replace that too. A nice cup of cinnamon tea. Either have some cocoa with some cinnamon, but don't add sugar to it. You could do something like that, or sorry, add cocoa to the cinnamon tea. Um, and the nice thing with the cinnamon, which is another thing you could be sprinkling on different foods over the holidays if you're a sweet tooth person like me, cinnamon helps to decrease your blood sugar. And so it really does help to regulate your blood sugar. So add cinnamon everywhere. Add it in your coffee and it sweetens it up, things like that. If you're trying to avoid candy or desserts, go for some frozen, frozen grapes, frozen mangoes, like just slightly let them slightly soften. Um, it'll give you that sweetness and the crunch. Or what about dates and nut butter, 
right? A nice, healthy dessert. I've even done that with prunes because I have prunes on my metabolic balance plan. So if I'm like really, really craving something, I'll have a couple of prunes with some nut butter on it. Don't forget too that if you're a baker, you can use different flours. Um, some people are really sensitive to wheat and may go up very quickly because it's very inflammatory or they have a lot of digestive issues. So substitute some alternative flours. You know, some gluten-free flours might be just as good in certain baking than um, your regular wheat flour. Melanie, mm -hmm. I have a question for you on um, sort of along the lines of the, the dates and the nuts and stuff. What's your opinion on Lara bars? Yeah, I think they're great. Um, they're very pure. So I definitely think they are a healthy bar. They're probably one of the most healthiest ones out there because they're very pure. They don't have, to my knowledge, I can't remember, um, I haven't looked at a label for them in a long time, but there's really nothing in them, but usually dates and nuts and seeds and yeah. So I think they're a great bar. Um, something maybe to think about as a little bit of a dessert too, like chop it up in a nice, place it on a nice tray or something. And mm -hmm. I actually guys just bought, um, I think a dozen of these new bars and I don't even know the names, so I'm experimenting with them. So I'll let you know how they are, but they are a protein fat bar and two little squares, they're a chocolate bar. Two little squares are supposed to keep you full for like four hours. So I thought, you know what, I'm gonna try them out, see how they taste. They're um, a company, just a, a new company from, I wanna say Quebec, and it's just this young team who put together these bars. So I'll let you know how they are, but I thought, you know what, something over the holidays might be nice, so I'm not reaching for, you know, junky chocolate. Might be something to try, so I'll keep you posted on that. Um, okay. Would you choose pecan pie or pumpkin pie? Which one do you think is a better option, guys? I would guess pumpkin. Any other guesses? I would eat both. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> <laughs> Just saying. Just small pieces at the same time, though. <laughs> right. Like equals one piece. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So caloric-wise, pumpkin, right? Pumpkin is definitely the better choice. So if there's a pecan pie, I might have it because that honestly is like my favorite. I'm not a huge pie person, but if I had the choice, I would go for the pecan pie. I'd have a smaller piece. But caloric-wise... Pumpkin pie, apple pie, sweet potato pie are all better alternatives than a pecan pie. So again, you know, you've got to make your choices fit for what you're doing. Um, avocados are a really nice way as well to add in creaminess. Like if you want a creamy salad dressing or chocolate pudding, if you guys are looking for something chocolatey, if you haven't made that avocado, it's avocado, banana, and cocoa, and you blend it all together, it's really, really nice. Um, I have a recipe somewhere. If anyone's interested, just message me and I'll send it to you. Um, you know, if you're looking for dips, hummus is a great dip, right? It's high in protein and it's going to keep you a little fuller. It's, it's not going to be um, the same as like a, a ranch dip, but it's going gonna, it's gonna to be a nicer alternative for you. Casseroles, guys, do your best to avoid the casseroles. There's a lot of unnecessary ingredients in casseroles, like the green bean casserole, the sweet potato casserole. What's that one with like the marshmallows and all that in it? I've never eaten that. To me, that's gross, but some people absolutely love it. So do your best to avoid those casseroles because you're really going to get a lot of excess calories and, and um, often sugar if there's things like marshmallows in it. Um, you know, instead do like a nice uh, green bean uh, with the almonds, things like that. You can make a nice side dish that's a little bit different than what you typically eat without the casserole excess. Um, you know, pot pie, a lot of people will do like pot pies this time of year because it's really warm and cozy. Um, you can mix that up a little bit too. You could do a shepherd's pie over a pot pie. So there's no crust, but you know, you could do the shepherd's pie with like a mashed cauliflower or mashed potato or sweet potato. It's going to be better than having, you know, the crust in the pot pie. You know, just too many starchy carbs when you're getting into the crusts. If you're... Um, a stuffing person, but you're trying to reduce, then 
fill your plate with more vegetables rather than stuffing, you know, or make that choice. You know, I actually do enjoy stuffing. I don't eat a lot of bread on a regular basis. So have the stuffing, but just be mindful of your portion amounts. Um, things for appetizers. If you are going to do appetizers, go with your proteins, right? A charcuterie board, um, an antipasta board, uh, even like just a shrimp cocktail. You know, you can stick with those proteins. You're not going to spike your sugar as much um, rather than doing, you know, let's say chips and dip or, you know, something like that, right? Um, or those puff pastries is what I was thinking, you know, like those high carb stuff. What else here? Dinner rolls, another thing. I would try to avoid that because it is going to spike your sugar if you're already doing like your stuffing and maybe you're doing your potatoes as well and then you're doing a, a roll on top of it. So maybe try to narrow down, you know, where you're going to spend your starches so that you're not starving after and you don't have that food hanger over after. And then lastly, I would also recommend that you try your best to avoid the sugar cookies. You know those cookies that have like the thick, thick icing on the top? I mean, if it's definitely your thing, go for it, but there's a lot of sugar in those, like a lot, a lot, a lot, okay? A better swap would be like macaroons. You know, macaroons, they're more dense, they're, they've got more fiber, um, and they're actually more filling too. So you might be better off even doing some macaroons. All right, guys, any questions, comments, anything that you guys have found are good swaps that you'd like to share? Like what have you done in the past at different meals to make better um, choices or just that you found was a better replacement or a, a, maybe a substitution for an ingredient? Anything, anybody got anything? Mm -hmm. No, that's why we're following the program. We need bad choices. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So biggest take homes, guys. I got hair in my mouth here. Biggest take homes, protein first, plan ahead of time. Okay. Just seriously do some thinking. What is what's worth it to you? Where are you going to indulge? When are you going to get back on track? Not that you're going to be completely off. Remember that it's just a meal right? It's a meal. It might be a, a meal a couple days um, separately or a couple days in a row, but just remember that it's just a meal. It's not an entire week. You'll be okay. Um, get right back on track and even plan ahead. That's the other thing we didn't talk about, right? Is if you know you really, really are going to indulge, take away your bread for the day from your earlier meals, um, even your fruit. You just have to have your apple every day. So you can plan ahead. And if it's an unplanned meal where maybe you weren't prepared, then just do the opposite the next day. Remove your breads, you know, get back on track, take out your fruit. Um, and of course, you just want to keep everything in moderation, listen to those signals, watch for that signal of being lethargic and gassy and bloating because you've likely overeaten. And I think that's pretty much it, you know, try to maintain your routine. Routine is huge. You know, Nicole even mentioned that as well for meal prepping, routine, routine, routine. Um, and the nice thing is once you have a good routine going and, you know, Shelly, for you, this might be helpful because you're, you're, you know, fairly new to the program, but when you have a nice routine going, it really keeps things simple, right? It's less to think about. You've got a routine and it just becomes second nature. And so if you keep that routine going throughout the holidays as best as you can, then you won't have a hard time getting back on because you never really got off the routine. You just had a different meal, right? So if you try to keep that mindset, I think you'll find things will be much, much easier to return from. So, all right, guys, that's all I have for you tonight. Is there anything else, any questions, anything else that you guys want to chat about? No. Okay. Well, wonderful. I have, I have to go. So I'm going to okay. sign off. So thank you. And I'll see you tomorrow, Melanie. All right. See you then. Bye, Thanks for everybody. coming. Thank you. Bye-bye. All right, guys. I will say good night to all of you as well then. Thank you so much for joining me here. I hope it was helpful. And um, yeah, I look forward to seeing you. We'll have another 
uh, meeting in the new year. This will be the last one for this year. Okay. Thank you. All right. You're welcome. Thanks for coming, Tracy. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Awesome. Have a good night. Thank you.